Dear friends of Ars Electronica, my name is Rafael Lozano Hemmer and I'm a media artist. I'm very excited to be here with you today to talk about the conservation of media art from an artist's perspective. As you may know, I'm an artist who has had some success in selling some artworks to established collections, things like museums or foundations or private collectors. For the first uh, 10 years of my career, I only worked in public art, and I always thought that collections were necrophiliac and vampiric, that it was something wrong with a culture of possession and conservation of artwork that did not allow for art to, in fact, have an honorable life and death. And then I started working with commercial galleries and, of course, changed my tune. Not so much sold out as understood that entire generations of artists have been erased by art history because of their um, disinterest in uh, taking care of their artworks after their life had begun. The idea of conservation in my case has to do with, on the one hand, trying to find an economic model to sustain the practice of my studio, and then on the other hand, to have a say in how my work gets preserved, what are the elements that can and cannot be uh, replaced or migrated, and also noting that a lot of the problems that we had in the studio had to do with a, a very fundamental troubling possibility, which is that at any given time we had 200 or 300 artworks anywhere in the world with like moving hard disks which were like ticking time bombs and any day any of these hard drives would fail and we'd get a phone call from the collector demanding that somehow this piece stop functioning and that it should be fixed. So I'm here to talk about different ways that artists can protect themselves against um, data rot and against um, the artworks um, being out of their control. But as well, most importantly, I'm here to talk about how we can, as a group of artists, as a, as a métier, as a, as a movement, decide that conservation should be a way to fund our studios. So I'm very interested in the economic aspect of how the maintenance, far from being a nightmare, can actually be a dialogue with interesting collections and a source of income for the studio. So. I do believe that many artworks should never be uh, conserved. They are meant to be viral, performative, ephemeral interventions, and as such, no one should be trying to uh, document them. But today, we're talking about those artworks that you are interested in making into an edition, you are interested in having an, in a collection. We will break it up into five parts, and we will show some examples of works that have been conserved uh, throughout time. Before making a media artwork, you may consider the methods that have been used to conserve media art up to now. Uh, however, I think that it's very important to mistrust anyone who has a method to conserve media art, because by its very definition, media art is expansive, and it's not a long time before an artist will take on a technology or a method or an approach that requires the conservators to go back into the drawing board and come up with um, you know, procedures to conserve. So the mistrust of conservation is the very first step. The second step is to study instruction-based art. So I believe that if people in the art world understand media art as a set of instructions that creates a particular experience, then there's a different discussion that takes place. So for example, I, I like to cite Mahali Naj Construction in Enamel 2, which is a painting from 1923 that was reportedly um, instructed over the phone for it to be converted into a canvas. But there's a very large tradition of artists like Sol De Witt or Felix Gonzalez Torres or Tino Segal that set up an artwork not as an object, but as a procedure that following some instructions will lead to the actual outcome. So by quoting these art historical instruction-based traditions, um, the establishment of the art world relaxes into understanding that media art is something that can be reperformed. So use Marcel Duchamp, use the idea of all of these instructions and concepts as um, the fundamental sort of uh, quantum of your artwork. The third thing is to study the precedence of uh, technological art. So oftentimes people talk about what we're doing as if it were new, but I think it's very important in terms of understanding the media art that we're making today to relate it to existing traditions of experimentation. So some of the examples that I like to quote are, for example, the, the work of Marta Minujin, who in 1965, a few months before Namjoon Paik ever got the porta pack in her performance installation La Minnesunda, she used video cameras to um, mix the live audience in the artwork to um, live TV. And the reason I like to quote her is for two reasons. First of all, because the pioneer of video art, close uh, circuit TV in an art installation was not Pike or, or Dan Graham or Bruce Nauman, it was this Latin American woman. So it breaks stereotypes over who were the pioneers. 
And the second is because it was over 50 years ago that this happened. And so to pretend that video tracking, observing the public, that the artwork is sentient, is something new, is completely disingenuous. And it's important to sort of establish that there is a tradition that is over 50 years, almost a tradition of, of, of this kind of experience uh, that has been happening. The final thing is to just understand that the, that the performance or the artwork itself um, cannot be recreated, that should not be recreated. That's a big part of the decision that you have to make. Oftentimes, I work with vintage elements that cannot be replaced, should not be replaced. And we will talk about the build of materials and all of that in the next section. Now we have a section on actually making the artwork. The first thing to do, of course, is to keep a notebook or some kind of electronic log of what you're doing and what you're designing. This will always be useful to be able to refer back to um, the methods or parts that you were using. The second one is to select open source tools, APIs that are in the open source community ensure that your work is not going to rot as companies go bankrupt and disappear. So a typical example of the problem we had with that is we used to do a lot of our early uh, face tracking um, artworks with Face API, which was a really robust system out of Australia that required you to pay, I think, $500 for a little dongle that would give you the permission to use the software. Of course, Face API then um, moved on and the company no longer makes the product or supports it. So all the projects that we had in the past that use this proprietary face tracking system now have been ported to OpenCV or Dlib or any of the sort of normal contemporary approaches in uh, face uh, tracking and recognition. The next thing is to consider using a versioning system like Git. Um, we've only now started to do that at the studio, and I really um, wish that we had started before. As you may know, Git allows um, the tracking, the tracing of all of the different changes of the different versions of a piece of software. This will be super useful to future conservators or curators because they can see what was the, ac what was the actual path to making decisions in a particular software. Also, it's a robust way to collaborate with others as you're seeking to comment your code for other people to be able to, to get into it in the future. Now, your software is your score, is the fundamental instructions that create the piece of music that you're trying to, to create. So the most important thing is to back it up um, right from the start. Um, use backup, uh, robust backup solutions. Um, I was recommended by Ben Fino Radin that at least I should have three copies of um, our data. Um, at this point, what we have is one copy, which is actually just a shared drive. Uh, where we put all of our uh, software code, where um, the Git is running. Um, and then that one's backed up automatically, both to a physical drive that sometimes we bring in and we exchange, and it's off of the premises of the studio. And then we just discovered that Dropbox has an unlimited data um, feature that allows us to mirror all of our uh, Synology drive, is what we use, Synology drive up to the cloud. Um, and that's really incredible because now we have access to this cloud copy of the artwork. It's very slow, but and it's also unlikely that Dropbox will continue doing this indefinitely. But for now, it's an interesting possibility to actually keep a copy of your entire, you know, even if it's like many terabytes uh, on the cloud. The next thing is, as you work, you should be keeping a bill of materials, B-O-M. And the, the bill of materials is basically just a list of every component that you've acquired. And this bill of materials basically gives you a URL for wh where you bought it. Uh, it gives you the brand. It gives you the function so that, you know, in the future, somebody can actually take that material, try and find a replacement, and if not, just replace the functionality of it. Inside of that bill of materials, there should be a column where you specify this is replaceable or irreplaceable. So for example, in my work, I use a lot of incandescent light bulbs and I'm completely married to the incandescent light bulb look and feel and sound and to the iconic Edison shape and the warmth that it produces. And so um, in the list for many of my artworks, I say that these um, incandescent light bulbs cannot be replaced by future fluorescent or LED or any kind of, of, uh, of future technology. And what this means is that the, the collector must be on the receiving end of the responsibility to actually stockpile the, um, the tungsten filament light bulbs if they want to conserve my work over a period of time. But the other thing that can happen is, in the case of tungsten filament, the reason why these light bulbs have been banned is not because they're toxic or dangerous, it's because they're inefficient. Um, so now we're seeing that there is a new set of fabricators who will build you custom-made tungsten filament um, bulbs um, that are specifically for artworks. So it's not necessary to stockpile so long as you can 
uh, describe in the bill of materials what is it about the quality of this light that can make it replaceable. Some of the time, if you're using, say, Nixie tubes, you want that vintage quality and you should allow for the artwork to die an honorable death if there are no Nixie tube replacements into the future, even if they're artisanally made. Other things, we don't really care. So an example of this um, issue is what Namjoon Pike was purported, purported to, be, to have said about his um, Buddha watching himself on screen. If you remember, this is the piece where the Buddha has a camera looking at himself and he sees himself in the CRT monitor. The question was asked to Namjoon Pike, if you wanted, if, if we had to replace the CRT monitor with a flat screen, like an LCD, would you accept that? And then Namjoon Pike apparently said, yes, of course I would accept it. I work with the technology of my time. This particular piece is about the circularity of vision of the Buddha seeing himself. It's not about the CRT cabinet contrary to other of my pieces where the cabinet is a fundamental thing. So all of this to say that each artist can have a different approach on a per case basis, depending on what they want to emphasize. But this needs to be established in your build of materials as replaceable or irreplaceable. Oftentimes, I don't care if what kind of art, uh, what kind of computer or what kind of display it's been shown on, so long as it fits certain criteria, which I specify in that bill of materials. So it's like, make sure that this display is no bigger than 17 inches because I want people to walk close to it and have an intimate relation. So as an artist, you specify what are the parameters that you allow uh, to change in the future, if any. Now, when choosing hardware, try to find mm, anything that has no, no moving parts. In my 25 years experience, if something's gonna fail, it'll be the moving parts, the motors. For example, um, if you have a hard drive, you get a computer, if it has a spinning platter, that's what's going to fail. So try and get solid state drives. Or for example, if you have a contact sensor, try and get not um, you know, a, a relay, a solid state relay instead of a contact switch. Or another example is if you're trying to do like a pan-tailed camera that is like robotically controlled, consider getting a dome camera that has 360 degree vision and then just actually do the pan and tilt virtually inside of that. Of course, if motors are fundamental to the work that you're doing, then by all means use them, but be, be concerned about uh, the reliability of this, of this kind of um, movement. Another important choice is to try and get off the shelf systems. So at my studio, we started working with computer vision and tracking of visitors uh, about yeah, 20 years ago or, some, or, or a little bit more. And um, we were very proud of our own proprietary tracking systems um, that allow the computer to see and pursue um, the visitor. And then finally, the Kinect came out from the company that I most uh, detested at the time, which is Microsoft. And the Kinect was a device that you could buy at Sears for 300 bucks, and it was a gaming system. And the honest truth is that it did the tracking very beautifully. It had problems with range and it had other kinds of problems, but by all means, adopting the Kinect as a way to, um, as a conservation practice was robust because millions of copies of this sensor were created. And, um, and, and that in comparison to say the Firewire cameras that we were using, which then got, um, uh, that, well, the, the progress just left them behind. So the Kinect is a piece that you could actually find uh, much more easily. Now, of course, if you're going to try and buy off the shelf, try and buy off the shelf open source hardware. So there's a variety of, um, you know, structured light initiatives out there that are made with an open hardware um, uh, proposal. If you go to our GitHub, um, you will find a taste test showing you different kinds of sensors that we've tested in the studio. And then things like Arduinos or Raspberry Pis, these, these are the appropriate um, tools for um, conservation because you don't want to be married to an operating system, you don't want to be married to a corporation for a specific uh, hard to find piece. Another note is to make global choices for your procurement. So for example, the simplest thing is if you have a piece which needs power, then make sure that you can have a voltage range that goes from 100 all the way to 240 volts. And this is critical um, because very often people will not read your manual and just plug it in. And if you can, buy auto sensing uh, transformers because again, you just don't want people to depend on people to actually flick the switch to get the right voltage into your piece.
So there's other examples of this kind of global procurement. I live here in Canada where people love the Robertson screwdriver, which is the square head screwdriver. Yeah, both English and French Canada love them. But it's, uh, though it's a beautiful screw head, nobody has them. So, you know, even though, um, you know, a Phillips screw is going to be a lesser version of a beautiful Robertson screw, that's what you should use because that's the global sort of procurement that you have to have in your mind. And finally, there is uh, the need to think about an idle mode for your piece um, or for an automatic shutdown. Oftentimes when you sell a work to a collection, they may, for example, put it in their country house and then leave their home and leave the piece on for two months before anybody comes in. So if, for example, you have a camera, a lot of my pieces will look at the, um, the tracking area and they have, if they have seen nobody for the past, whatever, eight hours or four hours, they will shut down automatically. And this kind of idle or sleep or shutdown modes are critical because you can't trust that uh, collectors will do what we need to do. So those are the notes on making. After making your artwork, there's several things that I suggest that you do. The first one is make a video of the work, uh, of the project showing its ideal operation. Um, if you're shy, then get somebody to interview you to describe what is happening. The second one is to install the project in a variety of computers or operating systems or devices and test to see if there's any software or hardware dependencies. Um, these should carefully be listed in a readme that you write. That includes, for example, what operating systems and graphics drivers or programming environments you need to run the piece. The next note is to prepare one or several flash drives or whatever technology of storage technology of the future comes to your project and put all the code, all the source code of your project in it, including firmware, um, like media assets, schematics, 3D print files, everything all the potential instructions to recreate your artwork from scratch should be in this flash drive. Make sure that you put installers uh, for the dependencies from the previous point. And then these flash drives are meant to be like a time capsule that holds all the instructions required to reproduce the work. Do include a document that explain that they should make a backup copy of the contents of the flash drive and ensure the integrity of the data from time to time. As you know, flash drives die over time, so you want to make sure that they know that there's the replication of this data is a fundamental part of keeping the artwork alive. But the spirit is that it's all um, sort of described in these flash drives. Now write a manual, and the manual should have several parts. The first part, it should have a meta-narrative just describing what is it, the concept that you were trying to address and uh, you know how the piece works. The second section is a detailed setup procedure showing you examples of how the piece has been installed, examples of, of how, how to install the work properly. The third section should just be a simple maintenance section with how to clean, clean the piece, do not use this kind of soap on the screen or something like that, as well as instructions on turning on and off or scheduling the work. And finally, a thicker preservation section, which would have the bill of materials that we spoke about, the schematics that are printed out, and then any comments on the code. Next, you want to set up the computer to be performing uninterrupted for a long time. So I have examples here. So ensure that you're not defeating fans so they could be cooled properly. No screensavers. Disable automatic software, software updates for operating system and Java, for example. No virus checkers. Monitor temperature inside boxes or enclosures. Stop all notifications. Stop all login passwords and so on. Finally, and most importantly, prepare a toolkit with any drill bits or special tools or adapters or with spares of components that you think are most hard to come by. This toolkit should have the, the fundamental tools of it. And in the next section, we will see how we can monetize this. When I ask fellow artists, colleagues about conservation, they're always concerned about their latest production. They don't really care. I don't really care about stuff I did 12 years ago. And so oftentimes you will find that artists are um, not willing or not interested in discussing the issues of conservation. Um, what I would like to do is I'd like to change this. I would like to tell the artists that this is a way to support their studios over time. By monetizing um, the maintenance of the artworks, you can actually keep your studio afloat. And if this sounds too capitalist or too materialistic or too possessive, the truth is that the money that is generated with the maintenance is something that allows you to have independence and autonomy and to have like a sense of supporting your studio without needing to have further sales 
or without needing governmental support. So it's always a tricky affair to talk about money, but that's what we should talk about um, as part of the conservation um, exploration. The first thing on dealing with a collector to do is to take that toolkit and the manual and the flash drives and the video that you made explaining the work and the spares and make a box. All of these materials should be in a box that you give to the collector explaining how important it is that they keep this box in a safe place and warning them that losing it will um, cost them uh, an amount of money. So you should decide what that amount of money is. I would recommend about $750. Something that is substantial enough that they think it's important to keep it because most of the time they will lose this box and at least you will make a buck. The second thing is to explain to the collector the concept of digital copy. So many collectors don't understand that the reproduction of a digital file is identical to the original. So for example, I've heard horrible stories of digital artists who have made, say, a print and they've reproduced three copies of this print and then they've been asked to delete or erase completely the original, say, TIFF file. I think that this is abhorrent in an electronic culture. If you acquire a photograph of mine, I want to give you the photograph, but then I also want to give you the memory with the TIFF file, with the printing instructions, with very specific reproducibility sort of instructions, so that in the future, if you need to print the artwork again because there was a flood or because your kid scratched it or UV destroyed the colors, you can do so again. So in a digital world, you want the artwork to be free. You want uh, the collector to be empowered with the actual original files to be able to reproduce that work. And this is uh, absolutely in keeping with this idea of the Sol de Witt or the Tino Segal. It's like you basically have the instructions to be able to recreate the artwork into the future. Now, a lot of people, a lot of collectors will understand this idea that the images and the source code and all of these things need to be free and demand an explanation about how exactly their investment is protected. How can they be protected from somebody not taking the original, say, TIFF file and printing a thousand images of this work? But first of all, if the collector wants to print a thousand images in, say, a um, color C print system like uh, Lightjet or Lambda, that's going to be very expensive, and so I'm excited that the collector likes the work a lot and wants to put all of these pieces in all of their kids' bedrooms or whatever it is that he or she wants to do. But the answer to the problem of protecting investment is, you know, centuries old. It's with a signature. So we've started at the studio as process of certification of each and every artwork that we have made. So we have, when you receive the artwork, you receive uh, aluminum lingot that has been uh, anodized twice, that has been engraved with the code from our database, that has a physical signature with a numbering, what edition is this, it has watermarks that take you to the different websites that keep the source code and keep the manuals and so on, and then lately it also has a blockchain signature. When you give this certificate to the collector, you must explain that the entirety of the value of the artwork is kept in this title. This is what must be put into a safe, for example, in a bank. If at any given time you want to take your photograph or your artwork and sell it, say, in an auction, it's worthless unless you can show this, this um, physical certificate. Now, this system is a retroactive system, so anybody who's ever bought a work from the studio is receiving one of these certificates so that in the future the artwork itself, the instructions, can remain viral, can remain open, can remain uh, shareable, but it is the value of the artwork maintained in this kind of um, system of valuation that, uh, that they understand because this is not unlike any other certificate of authenticity. Now this also has the side benefit of protecting you against the potential fraud. So it's not been my case, but I've heard horror stories of, for example, a collector paying 50% of an artwork and then uh, receiving the artwork and then not paying you the full 100%. Or maybe the gallery is keeping some of this money. So what you do is you do not release this certificate until you've been paid in full. And then once that's all done, you give the certificate. I recommend not shipping the certificate ever because the whole value of the work is in there. You need to give it to them like Asian people give you their credit card with a lot of respect and say, this is the certificate, you understand? It's like, yeah, I understand. Are you going to lose it? No, you're not going to lose it because that's all, the entire worth of the piece is in it. So it's very important that once you give the certificate, once you've been paid, they signed that they've received the certificate. So you get a little receipt, just like a FedEx delivery guy. Um, you get the receipt that the certificate has been given because if they don't have the certificate, it is completely irreproducible. 
And then um, one note which is very useful is to always say to the collector that the artwork price includes the honorarium for yourself or a technician to go and install the work at their collection. This is really important because egregious installation of the work may actually be a fundamental problem. People don't really understand the issues. So you should, if you can, include the cost of having this honorarium in it. Now, what you should not include in the price is the travel, accommodation, and per diem of each one of these technicians that you need to travel because you don't control where this artwork is going to be. Also, you only install as part of the value of the piece once. You, you don't do it twice. Now, the very important part is that when, you are, uh, when your technician is there to calibrate the work, they're not there to do wiring of electricity. They're not there to actually hang or drill onto the wall. You need to tell them that your insurance does not cover you for any of that. So the collector does need to provide the installers and they need to follow your instructions. You're there just to supervise the installation and then program and calibrate it for its proper usage. This also has the additional advantage that when you walk, for example, into a violent country like the United States, you can just say that you're not going there to work, you're just going to supervise the work of others, which means you don't need a visa uh, or something like that. Now, um, once you have um, calibrated the work and you've shown it to the collector and they like it, you show, them, uh, you show them how to turn it on and off and then you ask them to have a full run, uh, technical run through. So you can do this with a collector, but it's better if they have a technical department. You can teach somebody the very, very intricate details of your work. And as you're doing this, um, they're learning, they're becoming your first protection in terms of tech support, that someone at the collection is receiving the technical know-how to support the project into the future. They, know, they understand what the tools are, they understand where the source code is, they understand the dependencies. You try and teach them all of these elements. At the very end of this visit, either you or your technician will hand over a sheet that is basically um, a sheet that says that the work has been installed properly, that it functions properly, and that they have been taught to conserve and, and maintain the work themselves. Um, this is a very important little affidavit because it just tells the collector that from the moment that this document is signed, they are now on the receiving end of all of the responsibilities for the, the maintenance of the work. And later we will talk about some options on that. Another thing that you want to do is you want to install VNC or log me in or any kind of remote access method so that you may be able to work um, remotely and fix some problems that you might find. This is always very useful. Um, you can consider um, having network power bars to cycle the power remotely if necessary. So we've often found that if the computer is actually frozen, you need to do a good cycling of power and you can do that with um, sort of remote controlled network power bars. Make sure that the collector it has installed search protection and grounding to the power that you supply. I would say about 70 or 80% of the problems that we encounter in all of my artworks are electrical and search protection is a really important part of defending uh, your work. That should not come at your expense. You should demand that the harmonious presentation of electricity happen before you even arrive. And you need to talk about maintenance. You need to, to the best of ability, give a specific mean time between failure. This has even got an acronym, MTBF estimate. So what we're looking for here is, is to be able to be very honest to your collector. Say to them, this artwork includes a light bulb or includes, say, like a lamp inside of a projector that has a 1,000 hour mean time between failure. In other words, you need to help them understand that every thousand hours that they run the piece, they're going to need to spend $600 in replacing that lamp. And you're going to show them how. The reason it's very important to do that is because it has been my experience that many artists in the haste to sell the work just sort of say, oh yeah, it's, you're never going to have a problem, but they will have problems. And being able to notify them ahead of time is a really smart way to understand that in the future you can make money, uh, more money from this collector. So what you want to do is you want to use one of two metaphors. One metaphor is the metaphor of the fountain. So everybody, every uh, collection understands that if you're acquiring a fountain, you're investing a capital sum to buy this piece. But then you also know that you're acquiring a responsibility to maintain the fountain. You know that you're going to have to chlorinate the water every couple of weeks, that you're going to have to change rusty valves every couple of years, that you're going to have to change bulbs or any kind of, of maintenance required with a fountain. 
What's beautiful about this is that the fountain is like a metaphor for abundance and it's a landmark. Everybody understands a gathering around a fountain and in a way a media art is something like that. It's like a fire that burns that people hang around. And so this fountain metaphor has, has helped us uh, enormously. Just make sure that with the mean time between failure you can estimate for them how much it's going to cost them year over year. The other uh, metaphor to use, uh, especially if your collector is uh, in California or Texas, is the collector car. So you basically say you're buying something that's like a collectible car. You must drive it from time to time because collectible cars actually rust and rot if, you're not, if you don't drive them. So you must drive them from time to time. Don't drive them too much though because that will add to the cost of maintaining the car. So they completely understand this metaphor. And in here, in this metaphor, of course, one of the goals that we have is that you are the mechanic, not you, but your studio, and that you can continue making money out of the artwork. Now, talk about warranty. Uh, I go around the world talking to fellow artists about warranty. Um, and I ask, you know, how long should an artist provide a warranty for an artwork for? And sometimes I hear five years, some people say 10, some people say one year. The answer, the correct answer to how long the warranty that you provide is zero years. This is how long the warranty is that you produce. You are not a company. You can leave and move to Jamaica and never connect anyone again. You should be able to do have zero responsibilities with respect to the artwork. When you're giving this artwork to the collector, they are understanding the responsibility that they have in receiving it to conserve it properly. Now, you do tell them, okay, we're going to give you all of the elements for you to be able to take care of the artwork yourself. So you give them all the manuals and the bill of materials and all of that. Some of those components have a warranty protection. Like if you've given them a computer, oftentimes a computer comes with like a one year warranty. Those warranties you can provide. But a warranty for the functioning of the work does not exist and should not exist. And please don't ever add, suggest that you can warranty. What you can tell them is that there is a system of tech support. And that's what we're going to see in our next section um, about after making and dealing with a collection. So providing technical support can be a nightmare in media art and what is actually worse is not providing technical support because then you lose the collector. Not just you lose it, but the entire media art community loses a collector because they no longer trust that the works can uh, perform into the future. So what you want to do is, is uh, set up a path for them to receive tech support. The first thing to ask them is to read the manual. Most of the time, I would say 98% of the time, the problems that we find are there's a cable that is not nestled properly and there's no electricity arriving. So reading the manual. The second is to contact the installer, the installer that your technician or yourself trained when you did the installation. The third one is contact the gallery if you were lucky to have a gallery with a technician. And then the fourth is if none of this work, to actually contact the studio and um, we give free tech support for our artworks, um, so long as it's by remote control. So if we have to do it over email or we VNC and try and correct the problem and it gets fixed, then that's a remedy that collectors can have. Now, if none of that works, the collector has two choices. The first choice is to actually um, try and do the conservation themselves. Go, for example, to a third party, like a, a more forensic kind of um, consultancy that tries to solve the problem, technicians or AV. However, you need to clarify that if this installer, I'm sorry, if this conservator actually makes a, um, an egregious conservation of the work, if they do replace the light bulb with a fluorescent light bulb, that the work no longer belongs to the collector. We call this the egregious clause, and it comes from James Turrell, who famously, you know, in his contracts says that if, for example, you can't see into the sky uh, in one of his sky art pieces, that uh, the piece is no longer the property of the collector. It can no longer be called a James Turrell. So this egregious clause is in place um, to maintain the quality of the artwork over time. And what you can give them then is the possibility, the option to actually have the studio maintain the work. And so what that means is that a member of the studio or two, however many is necessary, will actually travel on site and fix the problem. And the costs are the flight, accommodation and per diem of the technician, plus any replaced, um, any replaced um, technology. So maybe you needed to change to a new hard drive or a new monitor or whatever. And then $750 per day. Um, of course, you can choose what the honorarium should be, but 750 is a number that is quoted very often in consultancies in engineering. Um, travel time, that's uh, the day of travel, is charged at half the rate. And then this amount of money um, allows the studio 
to maintain a relationship with a collector because they know that they have somebody who can come directly from the studio and make the necessary changes. It has been my experience that 95% of collectors rather have the studio fix a work than have a forensic approach to fixing it. And from my perspective, what's beautiful is that the, the amount of money that comes in is substantial and can keep people employed at the studio. This can extend into your estate. You can decide what, when, once you die that there will be these trained, qualified technologists ready to be able to maintain these artworks. And the amount of money that we will charge you will still be reasonable compared to if somebody needed to come from outside that doesn't know the system to try and make it operable. So technical support can become a relationship with the collector and an income stream for the studio. Now, you need to provide a migration path for the work and explain versioning for the artwork. So on the subject of migration paths, there was an interesting debate I had with Pip Lawrenson from Tate. They acquired a work called um, Subtitle Public. And that work was basically a, an early computer vision piece that used Firewire camera and XGA projectors and, you know, like very, and Windows 98, I believe. And it tracked people and it subtitled them wherever they went. And the only way to get rid of a subtitle is if you touch somebody else. Fast forward to 2015. So that was sold in 2005. That was technology of 2005. 2015 comes along. Now you have things like Connects. Now you have higher resolution projectors. Now you have, you don't need to have infrared illuminators to flood the area. Your robustness of tracking is so much better. And what was interesting is that Pip explained to me that they did not want to have this migration path to this new technology. That they, what they wanted is to conserve the original intent and the original speed and specifications of that artwork. Because what she told me, which, which to me was a surprise, but it was beautiful, is that she wanted people to walk into the piece and feel like they were surrounded by the technology of 2005. So I totally love that and I completely respect that. At the same time, this is an artwork that is a conceptual artwork. The technology of 2005 did not have as much ominous persecution of the public as I wanted. And so now, 10 years later, I could have that kind of technology. So we decided to settle on the idea that these two things are not mutually exclusive. That a collector, say Tate, can actually have version one of the work and then decide, you know, choose whether versioning of migrating to a second version of the work is something that they're interested in or not. The idea is that you just need to be honest with your public. So when they're seeing version two, they know that this is the version from 2015. There's also a world where you could put like the version from 2005 and the version from 2015 side by side and see the performance of the works. So long as people know what they're looking at, I think it, that, that versioning and migration into new platforms is something that is, of course, interesting. What's fascinating too is that I believe that the media artwork is not an object that is unchanging. I think that media art is closer to performing arts. And so the capability for the artist to continuously improve the piece is something that is inherent in the kind of systems that we do. So, so long as versioning is in place, just exactly like it, except with the actual um, concept of the project, this should be possible to do. Having said that, it's important to notify that versioning um, should end with an artist's death, unless you're like Gonzalez Torres, who had an estate that explained how you can continue versioning. Um, so there's a moment where the artwork, uh, you know, is no longer uh, changing, and that's with the death of the artist. The second thing to note is that the collector should be able to decline this migration. So they may be able to say, yeah, well, we actually don't want to acquire version 2.0. And it is important to also note that you cannot sell version 2 to a brand new collector because when they bought version 1, they bought the unique concept of subtitle public. Um, and you can now not make a second subtitle public, call it the same thing, have the same concept, just new technology. The only collector who can version and migrate a piece is uh, one that has already invested in the copy or copies that they acquired in their system. For this final section on the conservation of media art from an artist perspective, I'll just read the final notes that I have in the manifesto that is in our GitHub. It reads that you must trust conservators. They're absolutely fundamental for your work to have a future performance. They have a lot of experience in preserving the most diverse things you can imagine. Establish a dialogue with them and work out a migration plan. They tend to be relieved when the artist has thought through these issues. Above all, you don't want the collector to think that they're acquiring a future conservation problem. Although admittedly they will, because every piece, even a painting, is a conservation problem. But you want to hide that from the collector. Second is trust curators. 
but not as much as conservators. Uh, cu curators tend to be busy and they don't read the manuals and things like that. But in the future, there's the curator, the person who will state your work in a variety of different contexts. And so you need to explain in your documentation what the parameters that the curator has to re-perform the piece are. Keep a website. So for each piece that I've ever made, I do have a web page with videos and photos, descriptions, bibliography, and so on. It's very important in your website to give public credit to engineers, programmers, and other assistants, not just because it's an honest thing and it keeps them happy, but also it's a way for future conservators to track projects by different coding styles, for example. And the final note is about an experience that we did in the Moac Museum in Mexico City, where you could show up and either buy the catalog of the work, or you could buy a USB key for whatever, 15 bucks, that had all the schematics and source code and instructions to be able to recreate all the 42 pieces that were on view in the show. So to my knowledge, that's the first time that an entire show was of this magnitude was um, given away um, to the creative community to make their own versions of all the projects that were on view that happened in 2015. Now, today we have a GitHub account where we share some of our programming. It's github.com slash antimodular. And you will also see a copy of the best practices document in there. Um, I really believe that if other artists can take some of our methods and in a way have this infection of our techniques into their own projects, this viral capacity to conserve is actually something that also generates new knowledge and new um, experiences, new artworks. So by giving away source code, I think that we're creating a conservation path because what we want is instead of restricting it to something that's closed, we want it to be just methods that are shared and built upon by future generations. So that's my presentation. I thank you very much for your attention and uh, my apologies to have talked so much about logistics and money, but I do think that these are issues that uh, are a little bit taboo in our community and they shouldn't be because they help us have like a common front. Gallerists and collectors, foundations, all these people talk about money all the time and we don't get to. So I believe that conservation is one way to both uh, secure your place in your contributions in a bigger art historical uh, field and give you autonomy and independence financially to be able to support yourself and or staff to continue producing.